Um, so uh, I got this job of Go product manager. We build a product called Go, which is a CI and release management server. And uh, ThoughtWorks, the attitude is pretty much, eh, you're reasonably smart. Uh, we need someone to do this, go and do this. And uh, so I knew nothing about product management whatsoever, uh, and I kind of read a bit of stuff, and uh, <laughs> uh, at that time I was kind of naive, so I thought, well, I don't know anything about this, let's see what Scrum has to say about it. Um, and so this is more or less what I learned from what Scrum has to say about product management, that you're going to build something, so you need to work out what you're going to build, then there's this whole kind of prioritization estimation thing. You've got to make a big backlog and prioritize and estimate that stuff. And then there's going to be showcases. You need to give feedback. And uh, off you go. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of other stuff. You have to sit on sales calls, I discovered. Uh, you're expected to do competitive analysis. That's very important. And uh, pricing turns out to be a big deal. Um, there's a great video that Sun brought out about product management, where basically you know, someone goes and works out a very complicated pricing model. And then uh, they sit down at the meeting, and the VP walks in with a roulette wheel with a bunch of prices printed on it and spins the wheel and says, it's going to be $500. And it says, VP, very well done. Very well done, VP, $500. Uh, it turns out, actually, is pretty much how it works in real life. Um, so, uh, what, what I should say is that um, I'm no longer the product manager for Go. Uh, this is an opportune time to mention this. Uh, I haven't been for over a year, and nothing I say today reflects on the current product. Um, so, uh, ha having said that, um, uh, that this obviously is based on some of my e experience trying to come to terms with how to do this job. Um, so, it turns out. Uh, it's super easy. Once you've got an idea about what you want to build, we were going to build a CI and release management server. Once you've got an idea, it's super easy to come up with stories. I came up with so many stories. I came up with hundreds of those little guys, like loads and loads of stories, and we prioritized and estimated the hell out of those, and, and that was really fun. And then we had to actually build it. So that that kind of that wasn't really problematic uh, you know we had this idea of a deployment pipeline and we were going to make the ci server do a deployment pipeline and so we were like right let's build this let's get something in two months that we can start using and we found a customer um, internally within thoughtworks and we built it and gave it to them and they hated it and regretted the choice to to use it and gave us loads and loads of feedback and we built all that stuff really really fast and and, and that was great and we came out with the product in about six months uh, and i was really happy about that i thought that was excellent six months yay um, and you know the, the next two years were kind of a blur to be honest um, it's you know it, it's it's very uh, hard work doing project ma product management uh, and I should say some people talk about product owner and a product manager and there's this scaled agile framework where they kind of look at you know how many product owners you need for every project manager and all this kind of thing uh, I, I'm gonna assume that uh, you know th there's someone who's in charge of the product I'm going to call that person the product manager uh, and not worry too much about all this stuff. Um, if you're in charge of a product, you have this problem. You've got to work out what to build and, and all this stuff. So after finishing this job, I kind of stopped and I reflected a bit on you know, what was involved in this role. And um, the thing that I kind of reflected on was the first principle of the Agile Manifesto, which is this. So. Apart from the subliminal advert for my book here, um, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So valuable software. What's valuable software? What is value? And I kind of, I've, and that, you can't really answer that question, and I don't propose to actually answer it today, so it's a bit of a bait and switch, so sorry about that. Um, but I do propose to kind of think about it and, and think about what, what it means. And I, I haven't got a satisfactory answer to this, apart from to say, well, it's not a problem that you can solve by saying, we're going to have a product owner, and the product owner will decide what's valuable. The one thing you can say with absolute certainty about the product owner is that they will be wrong about what's valuable. I mean, it's... it's it's guaranteed. So this idea that the product owner is going to decide what's valuable and prioritize, I mean, yes, that's kind of what happens in reality. They're going to be wrong about that. Value is something that the product owner, product manager is going to be wrong about. Um, so that, that was kind of my first realization, which is kind of humbling. Um, so I kind of started to think about, you know, what do we mean by value? What is value? Um, and in corporate America today, uh, there's a very clear definition of value, which is shareholder value. And uh, these dudes, um, what were their names? Got them here somewhere. Oh, yeah, Jensen and Meckling came up with this thing called the theory of the firm, a couple of academics. And they basically said uh, the duty 
of public corporations is to maximize profits, and that's what value means. And this is actually true in corporate America today, and there have been lawsuits about it. The directors of a public corporation have a fiduciary duty to maximize profits. That means if you're a shareholder and the directors aren't doing this, you can sue them for it. And people have done this, and they have won, uh, which is kind of nuts. Um, However, it turns out to be a really bad idea. Uh, people who've done studies on this have shown that companies that put their highest priority on profit um, are universally less profitable than the firm that did not, firms that did not. So even as a way of maximizing profits, focusing on maximizing profits turns out to be a bad way to maximize profits, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's this book by Roger Martin called Fixing the Game. It says the shareholder value model has presided over a decade, a decline in the rate of return, both on equity investment and capital, accompanied by, guess what, an eightfold increase in CEO compensation from 1980 to 2000. So what's happened as a result of this uh, decreasing rate of return on investment, CEO compensation goes up. So it's quite clear who the winners and the losers are here. So... This is kind of not very enlightening as an approach to value. Um, so I was talking to Nat Price last night, and Nat Price says, well, yes, this is a load of crap. Um, let's look at what Elon Musk does. Now, who's heard of Elon Musk? Okay, a few of you. So Elon Musk was the founder of PayPal, and he made a load of money out of PayPal, and he had all this money. He thought, what am I going to do? Well, Elon Musk is now doing two things. Uh, and I think, basically, in my mind, he's the, f the foremost entrepreneur of, of, of modern times. So, number one thing, he founded a company called SpaceX. And this is, this is a, the Dragon capsule, which just recently, in the last couple of months, became the first private vehicle to dock with the International Space Station. So, he basically came out of PayPal and said, I've got a load of money. I know, I'm going to build a rocket. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to uh, make it fly uh, cargo to the space station. And uh, so that's pretty amazing, frankly, in less than 10 years he's done this. Uh, and I thought, well, let's, let's see what his vision is. So SpaceX's mission statement is this. <laughs> Elon Musk, he, and, and this, is, this is not quite as specific as Elon Musk is about this. Elon Musk says, I want to put people on Mars. So, you know, optimized shareholder value like, I'm going to put people on Mars. That's what I'm going to do. How cool is that? That's awesome. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about what is value, that, that, that's a pretty cool thing to do in terms of value. He also, on the side, set up a company called Tesla. Uh, Tesla Motors mission statement. Uh, Tesla Motors was founded in 2003 by a group of intrepid Silicon Valley engineers who set out to prove that electric vehicles could be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> which is just another fantastic mission statement. So, you know, what is value? You know, uh, th this guy, I think, has a pretty clear handle on what is value. He's going to go to Mars and build electric vehicles. Hooray. So that's pretty cool. Now, you know, Elon Musk is a multi-hundred millionaire as, as a result of having founded PayPal. And so, you know, we can't all be Elon Musk. You know, it's sad, but, you know, on the other hand... Uh, he's just split up with his second wife and things are clearly aren't going well for him on that front. So, you know, there's advantages too. Um, so, <coughs> I was kind of busy, I guess, you know. Um, but I, I kind of want you to meet this, this other person who I read about recently called Jack Andraker. Now, he was the winner of the 2012 Intel Science Fair. This guy's 15 years old. He won the Intel Science Fair for building a diagnostic tool for pancreatic cancer. Uh, which detects a, a protein commonly used as a biomarker using carbon nanotubes coated with antibodies. Uh, his sensor is 100 times more selective than existing diagnosti diagnostic tests. It's 168 times faster, 26,000 times less expensive, and 400 times more sensitive than the existing test. So, you know, 15-year-old messing around with some carbon nanotubes, as you do, you know, a bit bored, carbon nanotubes, <laughs> give that a go creates a new diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer that costs like a few cents and is a hundred times more selective than the, the existing, uh, existing test. And, you know, he's just a dude who lives in uh, middle America uh, who's just really interested in this stuff. So that, that's kind of pretty inspiring. And if you go and read what he says about how it was that he came to do this, he says this.
so I think this is fascinating. You know, I, I'm a parent. I've got two kids, and I'm constantly worrying about how I can bring them up to be, you know, the next president um, and, and generally just brilliant and, and better than me. Um, and I kind of think that maybe I need to teach them a load of stuff. And his parents basically didn't bother. They like, okay, go and work out for yourself. I'm not telling you anything. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting approach to child rearing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think this is, this is brilliant. And, and he says something which is just fascinating. I got really into the scientific method of developing a hypothesis and testing it and getting a result and go, getting a result and going back to do it again. So hold that thought. This turns out to be a very important tool when it comes to working out what's valuable. So one of the people who is probably the best exponent of this idea of shareholder value is a guy called Jack Welch, who was chairman of CEO. And in 2009, Jack Welch uh, said, said this about shareholder value. After 20 years of you know, trying it out. So this, I think, is actually very insightful. Your main constituencies are your employees, your customers, and your products. And you know, shareholder value is a result of doing that really, really well. So let's start with customers. Um, how do we create value for customers? Um, so I was reading a book by um, Mike Orson and Ian Bell called Lean IT, and uh, they've got this really nice quote. What do customers want? <laughs> And, you know, anyone in who, who's actually a product manager or a pro, uh, product owner in this room? Anyone? Okay, a few of you. And any, anyone who's built stuff for people, you know, knows that this is essentially true. What do you want? Oh, I want, I want, I want, and you say, oh, I'll, go, I'll go and build it. And you build it, and then you show it to them, oh, that's not what I wanted at all. It's rubbish. I want that. Go and do this other thing instead. Yeah, and, and this is, in my mind, one of the biggest problems with Scrum is you have these kind of, you know, sp you have a sprint and you build something, and then you go, look at my beautiful child and instantly someone's like, well, that's crap. Go and, go and do something else instead. So I mean, part of the problem is your customers don't even know what's possible. Uh, most of us don't even know what's possible. I'm going and seeing things. I mean, there's a Nat Price and Steve Freeman are talking about building stuff with Arduino boards. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, that new stuff is happening all the time. You know, I, I come to this conference, I've come to this conference the last three years, every time I've seen multiple things that have totally blown my mind. So, you know, we in the industry don't know what's possible, and our customers often, if they're not in the tech world, certainly don't know what they want. Um, so y you can't just ask them what they want. Uh, you have to use anthropological techniques, use field work, get out of the building, see what people are doing, think about what you're going to build, try a bunch of things out. I mean, we're building complex systems here. You can't plan this stuff in advance you're going to discover a bunch of stuff in the course of building it that will radically change what it is that you build. That's the fundamental truth of building technological products. And it, it, and it means that, that the whole kind of, we're going to come up with something, prioritise and estimate and build it, is, is in my mind, fundamentally flawed. And, and that's been my major learning from the last three years. Um, so along comes a guy called Eric Reese with this lean startup idea. So who's heard of Eric Reese or the lean startup? Okay, well, about a third of you. And Josh Kerievsky is going to talk after me, and he's going to be talking a lot more about that. But I just want to basically present what he says. Um, so he says, you have, you have a vision for your product. So this is universally true. Everyone says you have to have a vision for your product. And it is important. You need to, you, you need to have a dream about what you're going to do. Um, uh, vision kind of sounds like uh, something you'd have after taking drugs, which I don't recommend. It's not really a great word, but you, you have to have a, a, a goal, a, a dream about what you want to achieve, and then you have to have a business model to try and actually make money out of it. And th the goal is not to make money, but money is the currency through which you pay for innovation, fundamentally. So you have to make money. I mean, unless you're, I mean, even if you're a non-profit, you still have to make money, then you have to write funding proposals, which, uh, who's written funding proposals? That's miserable. Um, you know, but uh, you still have to demonstrate the value of what you're building to someone who's going to give you money. So it's fundamentally the same problem. Once you have a business model, you need to, uh, the first thing you should do is test that business model. And this, I think, is one of the fundamental things that's new in the Lean Startup. This idea that, okay, the most expensive way to test your hypothesis about how you're going to make something valuable, the most expensive way to do that is to actually build it. 
That's a really expensive way to test your hypothesis because to build anything substantial is going to take you at least six months and maybe a year or two. That's a really expensive way to test your business model. So what Eric Ries says is don't do that. Um, his story uh, tangentially is that he built this um, 3D avatar chat thing called InView and uh, they spent six months building it and he was really worried about the quality. He thought there's loads of bugs in this, we're going to release it, it's going to crash all the time uh, and that's not going to be good. Uh, but they released it because he thought well if you need six months, got to release it and uh, it wasn't a problem and it wasn't a problem because nobody downloaded it. <laughs> they went to the page which was advertising it and nobody clicked on the download link. And so he could have achieved the same results by producing a static HTML page with a download link which went to a 404 page, <laughs> which would have taken him approximately an hour if he was really focusing on like nice uh, kind of semantic HTML and some pretty CSS. <laughs> so that was kind of a massive waste of time. And so what he says is, well, you know, don't start by building the thing. Work out what the smallest possible amount of work you can do to test your hypothesis is, and then build that, and then iterate. Uh, and you know, th this should be familiar. This is the scientific method. You have a hypothesis, you work out how to test the hypothesis, you gather data, and then you iterate. And that basically is what he's saying. And it's, it's, not, I mean, it's not actually that new an idea, but I think, you know, to Eric Reese's credit, he's packaged it and synthesized a load of stuff and told a load of people and been fantastically successful. And I think that's really important because it's one thing to hear this, but I challenge all of you to go away and actually try and do this. It's really hard. I certainly don't feel like I've succeeded. Um, uh, it's really hard to actually put your money where your mouth is with this stuff. Um, and then, you know, you have to have a vision. You're going to build stuff. You're going to test and iterate. When you do that, you're going to reach a local maximum. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, later. And what, what that means is that, you're, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to get the most throughput you can through your system, the most people signing up, the most people paying you money. But it's not going to be actually the best way to achieve your vision. And you're going to have to change your business model and come up with a new one. Um, uh, that's part of the process of building great products uh, and building a great business, frankly. Uh, and then when you, do, when you reach that local maximum, you have to think again about how you're going to approach achieving your goal. So in terms of the process, there's this thing called the build, measure, learn loop. And what you want to do is optimize your process for lead time, the time to go through this loop. And that is fundamentally a different approach to process than the normal project management approach. Because normal project management approach, you optimize normally for utilization. You're going around looking to see if people are busy. You busy, you busy, good, you busy, good, you're not busy, why are you busy? What are you doing? You know, people project managers worry if people aren't busy. Uh, now, it's actually quite easy to demonstrate um, using queuing theory that if you optimize for utilization for people being busy, you create the most inefficient process you possibly can in terms of throughput in terms of lead time. Because what happens is, Im imagine you're going to an airport and you're checking in and there's all these desks and there's only one person there. That person is fully utilized and it's going to take you a really long time to get checked in because there's going to be a massive queue of people in front of you. If there's loads of people at the check-in desk, uh, you're going to get through check-in much more quickly. But a lot of the time, those people aren't going to be fully utilized. So just intuitively, you can see from that, if you want to get people, if you want to get work done as quickly as possible, you need a bunch of people who aren't fully utilized in order to optimize for throughput. So this is a way in which the, the standard project management process is, is, is fundamentally flawed, in my opinion. Um, so the easiest way to get really fast lead time is to reduce utilization, put Slack into our systems, uh, Reduce batch size, reduce work in process, so we're doing less stuff and working on getting that finished, so you have less people queuing up at the desk. And work in cross-functional teams, so we're all sitting together, so we don't have to get something done and then send it to the next group of people and have them send it back, because what we did was useless. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but it deserves a lot of time because it fundamentally challenges a lot of the preconceptions that we have about how we should run projects. Um, there's a great book I'll have later on a slide by Don Reinertsen called The Principles of Product Development Flow, which talks about this in more detail, and it's a brilliant book. So, you know, all very well. Maybe you accept this, um, but there is a problem with it. And the problem I generally find if I talk to people who are 
kind of more traditional in their process, and especially people who think that engineering is what software development should aspire to, uh, you kind of say this and they nod and they kind of go, well, that sounds like a load of crap. Um, and if you compare it to engineering, I mean, uh, engineering is held up, like proper building engineering is held up as uh, uh, what we should be aspiring to because, you know, software breaks all the time and it's buggy, uh, whereas buildings stand up and they don't fall down very often, don't kill people, and that's much better. And shouldn't we all do that? Um, and I went to, who's been to the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona? Okay. So, what an awesome building. I mean, it's nuts, but it's amazing. And not just is it amazing aesthetically, um, but it's also amazing from an ar architectural point of view. Um, Gaudi was uh, kind of an awkward child, I guess, and he spent a lot of time in nature looking at flowers and plants and, and seeing how these things were put together. And so, you know, there's a, the typical style of building at the time he was building was kind of very, you know, straight edges, corners, you know, you had pillars and they were straight and you had things balancing on them and they were straight and they were, they were big on straight in building at that time and Gaudi basically said well, that, well I'm not doing any of that that's that's actually not a good idea and he came up with a pa parabolic forms you know and there were arches um, the uh, that was actually an invention of uh, the what was the predecessor to the Turkish Empire that I, it was it was it was the Arabs in uh, the Dark Ages came up with this idea um, but he took it one step further and he actually built these hyperbolic structures um, so if you look inside the building a, a lot of the support is hyperbolic structures and, and this is really radical and obviously when you're building large things like this and you're using completely new engineering techniques people worry about that because it you know what if it falls down that would be bad uh, and so it turns out that you know this was not a waterfall process building this if you go down into the crypt of uh, the Sagrada Familia you can see that he had a workshop and he was constantly building all these scale models and trying out all these experiments and there's this great picture in the museum where he basically constructed an in first model of the church and hung weights to simulate the loads on the structures to prove that the thing would actually hold up, uh, wh which is a brilliant idea. I mean, what a genius to come up with that. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. So he was constantly having ideas and constantly testing and experimenting, and he built another hyperbolic church, or another church using the hyperbolic uh, architectural style, before he started work on the Sagrada Familia to prove that it could actually be done. So it turns out, you know, even in engineering, if you're building a truss bridge, you don't need to do any of this. You just pop the numbers into a model, out comes your truss bridge, off you go and build it, and it's probably not going to fall down. Um, building something that's unusual, you are going to do a lot of experimentation, and there is a lot of iteration, and you have to actually do a lot of uh, iterative thinking about how to build things. And again, you want to optimize for getting these experiments done really, really fast, and getting as much learning and information out as you can. One of the other examples that's often given about people who don't <laughs> don't behave in this way. Don't, don't, you know, I'll just get right to it. You know, the fondle slab. The fondle slab, no one knew it was coming out until it came out. And it was top secret for a number of years. And uh, you know, it was not a public, kind of agile, iterative process. People don't normally associate Apple with, with agile in any way. But uh, <laughs> if you look at where Apple came from, uh, who knows what Apple's first product was? Anyone? So the Apple One. The Apple One was built in Steve Wozniak's shed, uh, and it went out in 76 or 77, I think, and it looks like this. <laughs> A, B. <laughs> A, B. Um, so talking about minimum viable products, it's kind of a minimum viable product. Um, for the time, it was highly advanced. Uh, it had a keyboard, um, had read-only memory, had a video interface, so it was pretty advanced. But you know, consumers were not lining up to buy this. Let's say, um, you know, they sold this at the Homebrew Computer Club in uh, Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, and uh, you know, it's <laughs> Steve Jobs was a visionary, but this is this is pretty minimum, uh, although viable. Um, and if you look at the Macintosh, the history of the Macintosh, the Macintosh was the computer that really changed Apple and, and made it uh, you know, a real player in the industry. Um, well, actually, that, that's not strictly true. The Apple II is the one that made it a big player in the industry. The Macintosh was arguably, arguably kind of a, a real consumer product. And um, the dudes who made it have actually put a lot of stuff online at folklore.org. Uh, and there's a book that came out of that as well that I can't remember the name of. Um, 
And they talk about how they built it. And this is a quote um, for one of the people who built it, Andy Hertzfeld, I think. And here's what he said about how they built it. So you can see it's a highly iterative process. They were experimenting and trying out new ideas all the time. And one of the interesting things, that the, the hardware board was designed by a guy called Burrell Smith. And he develops this unique hardware design style based on the programmable array logic chip, uh, PAL chips. And what that allowed him to do is just basically treat the hardware, the firmware, as if it was software. He would reprogram it, burn a new PAL, stick it into the box, boot it up, see what happened. Oh, not quite sure about that. Change the code, burn a new PAL, put it in, boot it up again. So they could even be highly experimental about the way the firmware behaved and, and, and the ROM behaved. Um, so <laughs> They actually designed the hardware in such a way that it was possible to be highly iterative about the way that they evolved that as well. So, very highly iterative um, experimental process. Now, we were originally talking about what is value, value to the customer. And the customer hasn't really figured here. I mean, Ga <laughs> Gaudi, Gaudi's church still isn't finished. It's quite a long way over budget and over time. And Gaudi's famous comment about this is, uh, <laughs> He said, my customer is not in a hurry. <laughs> uh, most of us don't have that luxury. Um, <laughs> so I think the interesting thing about the, the Apple stuff, certainly the early stuff, is that they built it for themselves. It was really easy for them to work out who their customer was. It was them. Um, and, and so, you know, they didn't have to, I mean, it was specifically Steve Jobs, because you had to show Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs would, you know, tear you a new one and tell you to go away and work all night and come back with something that was actually good, you know, and it was probably a bit unpleasant if you were working for him, although the people who actually happened to develop this crazy Stockholm Syndrome where they said it was the best experience ever. Um, so <laughs> Steve Jobs was the, the customer, and, you know, the rest of the team were inculcated in the way of Steve, and they learned to see the way that Steve did uh, about it, and, and, and so they built it for themselves, more or less. I mean, most of us don't have that luxury, um, and so we have to think, uh, we, have to, we have to develop empathy, empathy for our customers, empathy for our users. Um, I was at a talk last week by a guy called Richard Sheridan, who works for, a, well, he's the founder of this company, Menlo Innovation, and they've got this nice exercise they do when they're building software for people, and what they do is they draw one of these on a table, and they come up with personas, so he's familiar with personas, the concept of personas, okay, so I'm not going to explain that, you get, well, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, you, you know, you get a bunch of people who you think can use your product and you kind of cut pictures out of them and talk about their lives and flesh them out in some detail so you can empathize with them. And what he does is he says, okay, in the middle of this target, you can put one person and that's the primary consumer of your product. And then in the next loop round, you can put two people, and then the next loop, you can put three people. But you have to start by choosing the one persona who is the consumer for your uh, products. Uh, and, and he says that they're, the people they're working with, their customers, find this really, really problematic. They never want to pick one. They say things like, well, we want to dominate the sector. Um, you know, nobody wants to pick one person. And, and Eventually, you know, they, they do it, and he, he says they deliberately build this really big, so that, you know, they put the personas on it, they, they glue the personas on, and then they make it really big so that the customer can't just put it in a drawer. They actually have to put it up on the wall where they can see it, and so they can be reminded of it all the time, which I kind of think is nice. And w one of his customers, uh, the, pro the product owner of, the, of the, the product that was being built, read the persona in the middle and says, well, I can't relate to this person. And uh, Richard says to them, well, how many of these widgets are you buying? And the guy says, none. And Richard says, well, why the, hell, why the hell should I care what you think? And the guy says, you know, that's the area of your process I'm still having trouble with. <laughs> Naturally, we want to build things for ourselves. Naturally, we do. And, uh, and actually, if you're building a product that's not just for you, you have to empathize and have to think about... Uh, other people and what they want and what's what's valuable to those people and that's hard um, and I think that the core part of this the the, the 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 one nugget that you want to take away from this is that you have to find a way to measure that value 
for those people because otherwise you can't you're not going to be able to build the right thing you're not going to build something that's valuable to them unless you work out how to measure the value that you're going to deliver to them um, and, and so that this is really where we ex we apply the scientific methods to product development in measuring value. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. A-B testing is very popular. It came from marketing. Uh, you know, you, all that crap junk mail you get in the mail, um, you know, they don't send everyone the same thing. They send different people different things, and they measure the response rate, and they're constantly iterating the junk mail they send out to you to find the very few people who will actually reply to it. Um, and, you know, email is the same thing. I mean, one of the interesting things about that is, you know, the Nigerian 401 emails um, that you get. You will have noticed in the last few years that they've become grammatically worse and more obviously nonsense. And they've done that on purpose through a, per through a process of A-B testing because what they've discovered is that they want to weed out false positives. They only, want the peop they only want people to reply who are so gullible that they will actually be taken in by this and so they make it deliberately less grammatical to ensure that only truly gullible people will actually reply so they don't get a bunch of people who are then going to you know in later rounds actually realize that it's a stupid idea you know which is an unfortunate reflection on uh, humanity i think in many ways <laughs> but it's a very uh, kind of compelling demonstration of a b testing um, but you know it's very easy to do a b testing in software um, google analytics provides it out of the box now. You can Google Analytics is free. You can install it. You can put it on your website. It'll track everyone coming to your site, and you can run A-B tests totally free out of the box. Uh, so that's a great way to measure if something is valuable to someone. Um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't want to release to the world, which is very common, you know, if you're Apple, you're not going to release to the world, you're going to get a bunch of real people. You're going to make them sign iron cast NDAs and then you're going to show them the fondle slab and kind of get them to use it and, 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 and uh, people film people using their products, you know, get out of the building, go and film people using your products and interacting with them and giving, giving you real feedback. Once, you, once people have got something, they can give you very rich information on what's wrong with it. But you have to get it and give it to them and get real feedback. Um, Another technique which is useful, especially in software as a service when you're building websites for people, is measuring real best business metrics. So one of the things um, the people at Etsy do is the ops folk at Etsy focus on two things. One, one is provisioning capacity and all the usual thing that operations people worry about. They also spend a lot of time building metrics frameworks that the application can hook into so they can measure user behavior and measure things like how many people actually buy, uh, what the conversion rate is, all these kind of metrics on people spending money. And when they put features out, they can measure the effects of those features on user conversion rates. Uh, so measuring real business, uh, real, you know, how much money people pay, real business metrics, and noticing when you put new features out what the effect of those is, that's another really compelling way to, to actually measure real value. And in fact, this for me is so compelling that the next projects I work on, uh, for me it has to be a web-based system where you can actually measure this stuff because it's so powerful as a technique. If I was given a choice between building something as a user installed product and building it as a website, I would always go for the website because it means you can do this and it's so powerful as a way of actually getting real time feedback on the features that you're building, whether they're really valuable to people. And then, you know, there's surveys, social media, all of this kind of stuff. For me, the second, uh, and all right, before I move on, uh, for me, this is part of the core of what products managers and product owners should be doing. It's working out how you're going to measure value and working with your team to work out how you're going to do that. That, for me, you know, once you've, you know, you've, you've got some funding, you've, you've got an idea, this is one of the first things you should be doing is working out how to measure the value of what you're delivering, whether people actually care about it and want to use it. And this feeds into the way we analyze the work we're going to build. Um, I often talk about done and done done. Done is dev complete. Done done is released into production. And one of the other nuggets that I got out of the Lean Startup is a kind of redefinition of the concept of done. Uh, and Grokit uh, say this about being done. So you're not done when you're released into production. You're only done when you work out if the story you completed was a good idea to have done in the first place. It's a step beyond released into production. It's we actually learned whether what we built was a good idea to have done in the first place. And that should be part of your story. 
part of the acceptance criteria for your story should be how do we measure if this is actually a good idea or not? I think that's a tremendously powerful idea. So let's look at a case study of this. Um, at Startup Lessons Learned Conf last year in San Francisco, a uh, company called Votizen uh, came along. This guy, Dave Benessi, did a presentation. And he had this nice graph. Uh, and you know, this kind of thing is gold dust when people actually tell you about their conversion rates for their products. Um, so they built version 1.0 of their products and put it live. It took them six weeks, cost them $1,206. And they acquired 5% of the people who came to the site and 17% you know, of those people, the 5% actually activated their account. And so they did a bunch of A-B testing and through A-B testing, they got to the stage where they got 4% referrals and 5% retention, people who actually came back and used it again. And they couldn't get any better than that by using A-B testing. They reached a local maximum. A-B testing couldn't get it any better. And so what they did is they did what's called a pivot. They thought, well, this isn't going to work. We're going to have to change our business model and come up with something else. And you know, we didn't, uh, I'm not going to go into exactly what they were. You can get the talk online. Uh, this is the URL. Um, but they changed their, their business idea. And two point, version two, you know, th this is the important number, it turns out, because you know, without this number, you can't actually carry on as a business. They actually got to the stage where 1% of people got revenue, uh, actually paid good money. And then they thought, well, 1% you know, is all right, but it's not going to get us where we need to uh, in terms of creating a sustainable business. And so they pivoted again, came up with a new idea. And uh, <laughs> everything else was looking better uh, until they got down here and no one was actually spending any money. And so they went to the back to the drawing board and they thought about it again, came up with something completely new. And then they reached 11% you know, revenue, and that was a big enough number that they could create a sustainable business uh, and work on it. So uh, you know, what you, the, the, the thing to take away from this is that A-B testing and measurement is not going to get you all the way there. At some point, you're going to reach a local maximum. You're going to have to think again about what it is you're building and come up with a new business model, a new idea, and try that. Uh, it's very important. That's why you need a vision. You need to have a vision about how you want to change the world and then you're going to have to try a bunch of different ways to actually do that. And you can't pivot too often because in the end it just becomes, you get cognitive dissonance over time and it just becomes too much work. Um, so that's an art. Um, but at least with the data you can realise whether you're there or not and make rational decisions based on real data. Are, am I there or not? We, which is really important. And I think ultimately the true measure of value is, is this. Are people actually going to use your stuff? Um, this, this is an article about writing, about writing novels. And uh, the, the subtitle of the novel is, No One Wants to Read Your Shit. And he has this fundamental realisation about the nature of what he's doing. And he says this, you know, writing a book is what he says, but the same thing applies to products. And I think this is something that it's worth bearing in mind all the time when we're building stuff. All of us, whether we're developers or testers or um, operations, product owners, whatever we do, you have to be thinking about this. The people who are going to use your stuff, they're, they're giving you their time and probably their money as well. Uh, and you always want to think about, you know, you, you need to respect that. People are giving you time and money and, and you have to think about how, how you're going to how are you going to create something amazing for them so that they, they do that for you? Because, you know, the point, you need to get money out of this, out of building stuff to sustain your business. But the point is not money. The point is achieving your vision. If no one's going to pay for it or use it, it doesn't matter. If someone buys it in management, but the users don't use it, it doesn't matter. And if users, I mean, <laughs> the classic example of this is the time and expenses apps. If users are mandated to use it, it doesn't matter because, you know, if someone's forcing you to use something, then you kind of have to use it. And so all, all your measures, all your measurements are kind of going to be off. So I kind of want to return to thinking about the product manager role. Um, we're kind of sh getting close to time. Um, so what is the role of a product manager, a product owner? What, what are we trying to do? I think, firstly, you have to not just create a shared vision, but communicate it to everyone on your team. Everyone on your team needs to be excited about what it is you're doing. 
salespeople, marketing, developers, uh, and everyone has to feel like they're contributing to that vision as well in order to be excited about it. If you've read Drive, um, it talks about the importance of actually people feeling they're contributing to what it is they're doing. The second thing you have to do is work with a team to define how you measure the value of what it is you're delivering. And then run experiments. Use the scientific methods. You have a hypothesis. What's the smallest amount of work you can do to test that hypothesis? Run that test, get feedback, build, measure, learn. And that involves making sure that your process is optimized for cycle time. And then something that Deming once said is uh, build quality into your process. And I think this is kind of tangential to what I've said, but it's essential for the role of the product manager is that Quality is everyone's responsibility. We all need to be thinking about what we're building and that it's valuable to people. So in terms of product development, here's the life cycle that I think is the one that I've come away with is, is a good one to use. Inception is where everyone on the team gets together and works out the vision and the business model and comes up with a minimum viable product. What's, what are we going to build to test our business idea? And then you start building it and then you get data and then you keep running uh, building new stuff, testing it, getting feedback, building new stuff. So start off with the defining, the vision, defining the vision and the MVP, get feedback, keep delivering in small increments. And notice what's not on here. Creating an enormous prioritized estimated backlog <laughs> is not on this list. Uh, and I think fundamentally it's completely wasteful, especially estimation. Um, estimation, I think, fundamentally is a, is a wasteful activity um, because there's a book called um, How to Measure Anything. And what it says is that when you look at products over their life cycle, cost actually has a very low information value in terms of what you should, what you should build. The high information value is value, the value it delivers over its life cycle. And if you've done a good job, the cost will be infinitesimally small, or you know, very small compared to the return you get on the investment over the life cycle of that thing. So estimation as a way to do high level planning and come up with cost measures, we spend a lot of time on that. And the reason we spend a lot of time on that is because it's easy to do. It's substitution. We've taken a difficult question, what's the return on our investment, what's the value we're going to deliver, and substitute it with a question that's easier to answer, which is how much is it going to cost? But fundamentally, how much it costs is not actually that important, especially if you're only building a minimum viable product. A much more important thing to do is say, well, we're going to time box the minimum viable product and make sure that we're going to deliver something in a few weeks, and certainly not more than three months. And that, for me, is the, the most important thing you can do, is say, we're, gonna, we're not going to take more than... Uh, we're going to set a rigid time, time box for this thing, few weeks, not more than three months, and build something and get real feedback. Um, how can I get feedback more quickly? So that's kind of the main takeaway from me over the last three years of doing product development, is that this is actually a, a much uh, superior way to, to build products. But I want to think for a little bit about individual productivity, because this is something as a manager you have to worry about, is you know how do you measure the value of your people? Um, and how do I, as someone working in the organization, know what value that I'm giving to the organization? Uh, and we've had a, a series of really poor measures of this. And people used to measure lines of code, right? You know, and, and people would have to fill in lines of code on timesheets as a measure of their productivity and, you know, for developers. And <laughs> this is fundamentally flawed because lines of code are a liability, not an asset. I, w I went into a, a large company and they proudly told me they had 10.5 million lines of C++. <laughs> and which, is a, which is horrible because you have to maintain that stuff and the cost of maintaining lines of code is extremely high. What you want to do is always be working out how to reduce the size of your code base. Lines of code are a liability. And lots of accounting, lots of CFOs start thinking about accounting in terms of measuring lines of code. I went Mike Nygaard went to a company where the, the auditors asked them to put in a subversion hook to measure the number of lines of code so they could count it as a line item on the balance sheet as an asset. Lines of code are a liability. Um, hours worked. Well, hours worked is... The problem with hours worked is that it encourages people to work at an unsustainable pace and it encourages heroic behavior. You know, the people who work crazy hours to get the system up and running. In my experience, those people are the same people who screwed it up in the first place so that it was undeployable. 
just saying. And, uh, you know, if you work, four, four minutes, okay. And, you know, if you work a, a crazy long time, often that just makes you stupid. So this is a really insightful statement for me. People focus on cost because it's so hard to measure value. How do we measure value with people? Well, my last kind of comment is this. Um, I went to a talk by this guy, Mike Rother, last week, and he, he studied Toyota. And Toyota, obviously well known for being the acme of lean. And he asked the managers, how, how do you learn how to be great managers? And they said, I don't know. And he said, well, do you go on training courses? No. Does anyone teach you? No. So uh, how do you do what you do? I don't know. And basically, what he worked out is that there's an inbuilt coaching process. You, uh, you're taught without knowing it. Basically, because the primary job of leaders in the organization is to teach people. And what do they teach them? They teach them how to run experiments really, really fast. How to always be trying new things and running experiments and learning from them. And that's how you get better as, as a person. That's how we get better at what we do at our, our jobs. And I think so. that's what you want to measure in terms of personal productivity and organizational productivity. You want to build organizations that learn fast and measure the value, value delivered. So uh, I don't have time to go into this into a lot of detail, but I think it's uh, an I very interesting. I'm going to leave the last word to Jack Andraker, our friend from before. Um, and I think, you know, for a 15-year-old, this is one of the, I mean, this generally is, is kind of the most insightful statement about building anything, I think. And that really, for me, is key to, to everything that we do. Value is what gives your life meaning. So find out what you care about. What do you care about? All of you, what do you care about? If you could guarantee that you wouldn't fail, what is it that you would do? If you could walk out today and do anything you wanted and guarantee that you wouldn't fail, what is it that we, you would do? Thanks very much. What questions do you have? We have like a couple of minutes or one minute or something? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yes. Hi. I liked your comment around value. Um, we did that. Thanks very much. So this lady for the recording is saying that um, her experience was that people focus on costs and, and estimation. And the problem with estimates is that they're, they're wrong, especially as predictions. They're, they're terrible and they set up the wrong expectations. And that, that's absolutely right. That's something I didn't address, but this is another reason why estimation is not just valueless, it actually has negative value because it sets up the wrong expectations. People expect your estimates to be right. And again, the one thing I can tell you about your estimates is they will be wrong. And they'll set up bad expectations. What estimation does do is estimation helps create a shared vision of what you're going to build. That, for me, is the biggest value of estimation is that at the end of it, after days of grueling breaking down of features and arguing over implementation and coming up with numbers and variances. You know, you do this for days and it's exhausting. Everything you come out with is going to be wrong. But what you have done, which is useful, is, is come up with a shared vision of how to build a product. Uh, and that's great, but there's a way to achieve that that doesn't involve coming up with all these meaningless numbers. And you're right, you know, focusing on value instead, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a game changer. So thanks. Thanks for sharing your experience. Yeah, one more. So, so what do you answer? So the question is, you know, managers say that they want estimates because they have an idea and um, they say, well, great, you can build that. How, how long is it going to take or how much is it going to cost? And how do you answer that question? Well, I think that the problem is you don't know what you're going to build. Anytime you're building anything innovative, but I mean, if you're building an accounts payable system, you know what you're going to build, but then you shouldn't be building custom software. You should buy an off-the-shelf package. Don't customize it. Customize your process to meet the way the package behaves and build it. If you're building cost custom software, it's because you want to do something innovative. And sorry, if you're doing something innovative, you don't know what you're going to build. And so fundamentally, you know, you have to say, we don't know what we're going to build. And so we can't estimate it. What we can do is work out how to test the business idea. And we want to do that in a short amount of time so we can cut our losses if it turns out not to be a good idea. Let's work out how we can test that idea in a couple of months so that we can cut our losses if it turns out not to be a good idea and just reframe the problem. Reframe the problem is we, we've got an idea for what we want to build. We don't know what it's going to look like. If we do get too detailed, we're going to be wrong. Let's work out how we can test that hypothesis. You have to reframe the discussion. Yeah, and some people aren't going to get it. 
and you know then there's not very much you can do but i think you know hopefully people have had enough experiences of it going horribly wrong that they want to try something different that's certainly been the case for me that's it right okay well i'll be around feel free to get in touch with me um thanks thanks for coming